Two years ago, I discovered my wife Rhonda was having an affair that led to a vicious argument that ended with me packing my bags and moving out. Of course, my moving out wasn't due to the argument I was moving out because I wasn't going to live with a cheating woman our marriage was over the second she let another man into her panties. I checked into a motel near my office. It was kind of seedy, but it would do until I found something more permanent. I put the two suitcases I had packed into my room and walked to a nearby neighborhood bar, intent on getting drunk and drowning my sorrows by walking. I wouldn't risk a DWI. The place I chose was pretty much empty, due mainly to the fact it was a weak night. There were two couples sitting at tables and one older man sitting at the bar nursing on a bottle of beer. I found a booth over on the far wall, away from anyone else. I wasn't in the mood for conversation. The boar-looking waitress came over, and I ordered a shot of Jack and a beer. By the time I had finished my second round, I had had enough time to do a little thinking. I realized that I could either sit around feeling sorry for myself, or I could do what I normally do and meet this problem. Head-on, I was a spec builder, building upper-scale homes, and it was at the height of the housing boom I would always have two or three houses in progress at any one time, and when construction problems arose, I learned that it would cost me money if I didn't tackle them right away with a new resolve. I returned to the motel for a fitful night of sleep the next morning I went to the bank and moved all our money from our joint accounts into one in my name only in order to protect myself next. I canceled all our joint credit cards, keeping two that were in my name only, and the ones that I had set up for my business. My final stop of the day was to my lawyer to draw up divorce papers. Keith was a friend of mine as well as my lawyer, and even though he specialized in real estate law, his wife, Shelley, who was a lawyer and his partner dealt in family law, after they both told me how sorry they were at the circumstances I found myself, and we sat down to go over the details, I, I was given the usual spiel telling me how this was a community property state, and that she was going to be entitled to half of everything, and that I would be responsible for paying child support. I told them I was well aware of that, but there was no way I was going to change my mind, and to proceed with the paperwork, because of our daughter, I filed for dissolution, on the grounds of irreconcilable differences, rather than adultery. I had done well in my business, and even having to give her half would still leave me well off. I just wanted to rid myself of a faithless 304 wife. I slept better that night, knowing that I was now taking charge of the situation. It was Friday evening, the second full day after I had packed my bags and left, that I received a call from Katie, my 13-year-old daughter, telling me that she had not seen or heard from her mother since she got home from school, and she was all alone and hungry. Cursing my hopefully soon-to-be ex, I jumped into my truck and headed home. I consoled my distraught daughter, then headed into the kitchen to fix her something to eat. It was under a magnet on the refrigerator that I saw an envelope with my name on it in my wife's handwriting, as curious as I was at to see what was inside. I tossed it on the counter to read later and continued to make dinner for Katie. It was only after we had eaten and watched a little TV, and I had put Katie to bed. Did I return to the kitchen? I picked up the envelope and went into the den. I poured myself a shot of bourbon and downed it, and sat down to read whatever was inside. It was a note from my wife in which she said that I was crazy if I thought I was going to saddle her with a child to raise it. Went on to say that she was leaving. And for me not to bother looking for her to say I was stunned is an understatement I realized I had never really known the woman I had married. I just could not understand how in the hell a mother could abandon her child. I went up to what had been our bedroom and saw that most of her clothes and personal items were gone. I waited until the next morning to call Keith and Shell to talk over this new development and find out how it was going to affect my attempt to divorce my wife Shell advised me to wait until Monday and then she would. Accompany me to my wife's place of work. She would have the divorce papers drawn up and we could have her served there. The hardest thing was sitting down with Katie to talk to her about what was going on. She already knew that her mother and I were having problems since I hadn't been home for the previous two nights. I decided that being honest with her was for the best. And I told her that her mother had left a note saying that she was leaving, other than that I really couldn't answer her questions about when she would come back as I didn't know myself. We managed to get through the weekend, and Monday morning I fed Katie her breakfast and dropped her off at school. I drove to my wife's place of work where I met up with Shelley together. We went inside to inquire if my wife was there at the mention of my wife's name. We were directed to the Human Resources office where we learned that she and her boss had both turned in their resignations the previous Friday.
Somehow I wasn't all that surprised as I had found out that the man she had been having the affair with was her boss. Her boss was stupid enough to have a sexual relationship with an employee under his direction, but was smart enough to realize that when I made an issue of it, he was going going to lose his job for breaking company policy against fraternization between a manager and an employee under their supervision once outside in the parking lot. Shelley advised me that it would be in my best interest to file a missing persons report with the police. As she had been gone for over 48 hours, they would be obliged to take the report, and with any luck find her, she followed me down to the police station where a detective took my statement that my wife was missing. I was honest with him and told him that the reason I wanted to find her was so I could have her served with divorce papers. And the reason for the divorce, I showed him the note she had left and told him what we had learned about her and her lover quitting their jobs. He wanted to know if I had an alibi for the Friday she was last seen on. And I assured him that I had spent the whole day at one of the houses I was building, and there were several contractors that could verify that at the end, the cop told me that if they determined that there was no foul play involved, and she had left of her own vulsion, there wasn't too much they could do. I then offered to buy Shelley lunch, and we called her husband and met up up at the Olive Garden. We requested a table that was fairly private so we could talk. So Shelley, what does this do as far as the divorce, if we can't find her to have her served? I asked what that means in this state is, you are going to have to wait for a year before you can file on the grounds of abandonment. I'm sorry, Steve, but that is what the law states. Shelley answered, the reason I wanted you to report her missing is so that we have an official report of when she left to document it, other than that if the police don't locate her, your only other option, if you want to pursue it, is to hire a private agency to try to track her down. Well, I guess that gives me something to think about. I guess I will wait until I hear from the police. Honestly, though, I don't know if I even want to know where she's gone, as I'm in no hurry to get married again, if ever. I guess waiting a year isn't that big of a deal as long as I don't have to deal with her. I could see the look of sympathy in Shella's eyes when I said I wasn't looking to get married again. She reached over and patted my hand. Steve, I know how tough this is on you, and I know you're hurting right now, but, but as your friend, please promise me that you're not going to cut yourself off from life for now. My focus is on Katie. I'm sure she is even more shocked and hurt than I am. I have to be there for her. Keith and Shelley both nodded their understanding and told me they were both there for me and would help any way they could after lunch. I went by one of my job sites and checked up on the progress and then went a Katie school to wait for her to get out as she exited the building. I saw her looking around almost frantically until she saw my truck upon which she came running as fast as she could. I stepped out and she flung herself into my arms. I could feel her shaking. I was afraid you wouldn't be here. She sniffled into my neck where she had buried her face. Oh, baby, I promise I'm not going anywhere. I answered, hugging her tight to me. Do you really promise? She asked, staring at me with her big blue eyes shimmering with tears. Yes, honey, I really promise. I kissed her forehead and carried her around to the passenger side of the truck and seat belted her in. I again cursed my wife as I walked around to get in with with a little prodding. I finally got Katie to open up about her school day on the drive home. Once home, Katie wouldn't let me out of her sight. I continued to do my best to reassure her that I wasn't going to abandon her, despite that she began to have nightmares, and I would wait to hear her sobbing in her sleep. I would rush to her room, and when I would awaken her, she would throw her arms around me and hang on as if for dear life. When I asked her what she was dreaming about, she said that she was lost, and she couldn't find neither her mother or me. The biggest saving grace I had at this time was my office manager. I had hired Renee to help me with the many mundane aspects of my work, such as filing for permits and arranging for inspections, so as to free me up to concentrate on the more demanding tasks. Since then, I had come to totally rely on her. She now worked to keep the subcontractors on schedule, and ordering and tracking materials, as well as handling all the necessary paperwork I might go several days without stopping in at the office, but I never worried about it as I knew Renee was able to handle it. I had such trust in her that I even had her make out the checks to pay the subs or vendors. All I had to do was stop in on Friday and sign them. And then she would see to it they got delivered when I had decided I needed help running my business. 
I had put out an ad in the local paper and had begun to interview people I was getting discouraged with the respondents and couldn't find anyone who had the qualifications I felt were needed to handle the job that was, until Renee applied for the job, I still remember the day she walked in the door. Even though I was married, I still recognized a good-looking woman when I saw one. She stood only 5'4", but she had such lovely big brown eyes and a cute button of a nose. I judged her to be in her early 30s, and she obviously kept herself in shape. By what I could see, she wore a blue business suit that, even though it wasn't revealing, did little to hide her trim figure. The interview went well, and I was impressed by her qualifications. She had worked for her father, who owned a construction company, and was well-versed in the business. When I asked her why she no longer worked for him, she explained to me that her husband had been transferred here here, so they had to move away. I also learned that she had a daughter the same age as my Katie, and now that she was in school, Renee wanted to return to the workforce. We reached an agreement on wages, and I had an office manager now. Don't get the wrong idea, nothing ever happened between the two of us. Not even flirting on my part, that was because I was married and took my vow seriously. And even if I wasn't married, she was I have a firm rule that I never mess with another man's woman for her part. It was obvious she loved her husband very, very much and wasn't the type of woman to mess around. I had let Renee know about what was going on with my marriage, and when I told her about the nightmares that Katie was having, she immediately suggested that I should put her in therapy. I quickly realized she was right, and together we found a therapist who was willing to work with us. I had chosen a woman therapist because I believed that it would put Katie more at ease as she had always been extremely shy around men. She didn't know I met with Dr. Walters to tell her about all the things that had happened and why I felt it was necessary for her to see Katie we set up a schedule to meet twice a week, and she let me know that it would be good if I were to be available, as she would want to see us together at times, and just Katie alone at others' other events that had happened in the meantime, was that the day after I had made a missing persons report, the police sent over a woman detective to talk to Katie. My daughter told them that the last time she had seen her mother was Friday morning before she left for school, and that her mother had seemed distracted. But Katie hadn't been all that concerned at the time. It was a week later that I was asked to come down to the station and meet with the detective I had first talked with. He said their investigations had tracked her lover's credit card usage to two motels, and they had determined with the use of pictures that the two were together of their own free will, they had apparently left the state. And as there was no evidence of foul play, the police weren't going to pursue the case any further the next two months passed, and the therapy seemed to be working for my daughter. I believe that she finally understood that it was in no way her fault that her mother had left, but more importantly that I would always be there for her. The frequency of her nightmares had dropped off and she no longer had to keep me in sight. Whenever we were together, Renee and her husband began to invite Katie and me to their house for barbecues. At first, I was hesitant to accept, but Renee convinced me that it would be good for Katie to spend time with her daughter doing normal girl things. I knew her husband James from having met him at different times but I was a little concerned how he would take his wife inviting a man, even if it were her boss, into their home, I quickly found that my worries were for nothing. He and I quickly bonded and became friends. My Katie and their daughter Gina also quickly bonded and became best friends, not only that, but Renee, being a loving mother, made sure to spend time with both girls, giving Katie what I felt was much-needed motherly guidance. My wife had been gone for ten weeks with no word from her, and I decided it was time to rid my bedroom of the last vestiges of her former presence. Although she had apparently packed a lot of her clothes and personal effects, she had still left stuff behind. I brought a couple large guard garbage sacks up and started going through her drawers, emptying out her belongings in the last drawer, which was mostly sweaters. I found a small box tucked into the back. Being curious, I opened it up and gasped. When I saw what was inside, there was a baggie with at least a four ounce of pot in it and a vial of white powder. Now, I wasn't naive about drugs in my younger days before I married Katie's mother. I had done some experimenting myself, but put that aside when I graduated college and got serious about life. I opened the vial and sniffed at it before taking a little powder on my finger and tentatively tasted it cocaine. The only other thing in there was a CD. I turned on my computer and put in the disc to see if there was anything on it that I could access. I saw that it contained a movie. So I opened it with the movie player and was surprised to see that it was obviously shot in the basement I had built the house we lived in. 
and had the basement set up with exercise equipment on one side, and the other was basically a game room with a pool table, plush couches, and large screen TV. The scene showed four couples sitting or standing most with drinks in their hands. Two of those people were my wife and her boss. I advanced the movie forward, and at this point I saw people passing around joints, while others were snorting lines of white powder off the glass top of the coffee table. Once again, I forwarded the movie, and this time it showed my wife impaled on a man lying on his back. There was a second man shoved behind her, and a third standing to the side near her face. I have always had a strong sex drive, and even occasionally watched some corn when my wife was on her period and not receptive to my advances, and I know there are men out there who get off to seeing their wives having sex with other men, but I'm not one of those. All I felt was a great upheaval in my stomach, and I raised for the bathroom, I would like to say, that I made it to the toilet. But alas, my vomit spewed forth across the floor. I did finish up emptying my stomach in the toilet and then sat there in a daze for a while. Finally, I pulled myself together and headed to get a mop to clean up the mess on the way out. I saw the movie was still playing on my computer without looking at the screen. I quickly shut it down. After I had everything cleaned up, I called Shelly. Hey, Shelly, it's Steve got time to talk, Steve Keith, and I always have time for you. What's up? She replied. Well, I decided to get rid of some of Rhonda's stuff that is just taking up space, and in one of her drawers I found a box with drugs and a CD. I was wondering if I should call the police and report the drugs honestly. I don't, that would be a good idea, the drugs are in your house house, and if it came down to it, it would be your word against hers as to who they belong to. I really think you would be best off getting rid of them. Wow, I didn't really consider that. I said, how about the CD? I put it in my computer, and it's a movie of her and her friends doing drugs and having unprotected group sex. That woman had an orgy in my basement. Oh, God, Steve, I'm sorry. I know that you would never have wanted to see that. However, since it was filmed in your home, it could be used as admissible evidence in court, especially if came down down to a matter of custody. I would suggest you hide it somewhere secure in case it's needed. That's what I was hoping you would say. I intend to try to do anything I can to keep her away from Katie. So how are things really going? James asked me on our fourth visit to their house. The girls were out of earshot, being in the house preparing lunch. I guess things are as well as could be expected when you find out your wife is a 304 into drugs and group sex. I answered what James said with a gasp. I went on to tell him about the CD and drugs I had found. I guess I never really knew her. The woman I thought I had married would never have done something like that. You don't know how lucky you are to have a woman like Renee. Actually, I do not a day goes by that I don't thank my lucky stars that she chose me to love. She's a beautiful woman, and I know guys hit on her, but I have always trusted her to do the right thing now if I just get her boss to stop hitting on her. James said with seeming seriousness, just as I was taking a drink, I couldn't help but splutter at his statement, spitting my drink down my front, my head swiveled to look at him. Jesus, James, you don't think I would ever make a pass at Renee, I coked out. I then noticed the mirror in his eyes, and he burst out laughing. Relax, buddy, Renee tells me everything about your relationship. That's why she enjoys working for you so much. You treat her with total respect, and she knows you would never do anything to abuse her respect for you. I grinned back at him. Yeah, well, it's a rule I've always lived by. Not only have I never made a play for a married woman, I won't even make one if I know the woman has a boyfriend. If you were able to take a woman away from the man she was with, how could you ever trust her not to do the same thing with the next guy that came along? That's even more true now that it's happened to me. One other thing that happened as a result of me finding the disc left behind by my wife is that at the meeting with the therapist following my discovery, she obviously could tell that something dramatic had happened. She asked to see me the following day without Katie. I must say Dr. Walters knew her business. It didn't take her long to ferret out of me what had happened, and the next thing I knew, I was having one-on-one -on -one sessions with her. It took a couple of months for her to make me realize that I had been suppressing many of my true feelings and another couple months to help me come to terms with them and deal with it in the end. She had truly helped both Katie and me to get past this Oriole. When a year had gone by, Shelley put forth my petition for divorce. We had no reason to present the CD movie as Rhonda's desertion of her family and failure to make any contact with her daughter or me was seen as justifiable cause to grant the divorce and give me sole custody of my daughter. I still kept the movie hidden away as insurance in case Rhonda ever did return and counterfile for custody. 
Just when things seemed to have settled out for everyone came the next tragedy in our lives. James was an avid cyclist and even rode in amateur races during a race there had been a pileup and James had suffered a deep, thy brew. What no one knew at the time was that he had developed a blood clot which broke loose and lodged in his brain, causing a massive stroke when it happened we were at work. I was sitting in my office reviewing the plans for a new house I was getting ready to build when the phone call came. I heard Renee answer the phone. Suddenly I heard her cry out and I rushed out to her side. She had a frantic look as she stared at me. It's James, they've rushed him to the hospital, she blurted out as she stood and grabbed her purse. She started to run out of the office and I chased after her. Come on, get in my truck, I'll drive, I said when I caught up with her. At first she gave me a blank stare, then nodded and let me lead her. I put her in the passenger side and hurried to get behind the wheel except for telling me which hospital she never said another word for the rest of the ride whenever I would glance over at her. I could see her shaking with worry when we reached the hospital. I pulled up in front of the emergency admittance and she leapt from the truck and rushed in. I hurriedly found a parking spot and ran back to the doors. When I went inside, I saw that Renee had already inquired about James, and she was clearly distraught. I went to her, and she looked at me and told me that the doctor doctors were working on James, and they didn't know anything yet. I put my arm around her and led her over to the waiting area and sat with her. After a half hour, I realized that it was getting close to time to pick up our daughters at school. Not wanting to leave Renee alone, I called Shelly and gave her a brief rundown on what was happening and asked if she could pick up the girls at school and bring them to the hospital. She assured me she would. I then called the school and asked them to have the girls ready to be picked up. Shelly called me just before they arrived and I told Renee they were here. I went out to meet them and asked Shelly to take Katie with her and keep Renee company while I talked with G. I took her to a quiet spot and as gently as possible told her that her father had been brought to the hospital and was in the emergency room with the doctors. I let her know that it was apparently serious, but we would have to wait for the doctors until we knew how bad it was. Jay did her best to put on a brave face and followed me back to the waiting room. I thanked Shell for her help, and before she left, I promised to call her if we needed her help again, for for the next half hour we sat in silence me hugging Katie and Renee holding Jeannie. Finally, a nurse came out and asked us to follow her and led us to a private sitting room. Soon, we were joined by a doctor. The news was not good. Even though James was still alive, he was being kept that way by life support. Renee collapsed in tears, and I held her in my arms as she sobbed. We continued to wait until they had James placed into ICU, and then Renee and Jay were allowed to see him after some time had passed. Renee and Jay came back out. Steve, would you look after Jay for me? I'm going to stay here, Renee asked me. Jay started to protest, so I knelt in front of her, sweetie. You need to be strong for your mother right now. You come home with Katie and me, and I will bring you back in the morning. If anything happens, your mother will call us. Okay, with tears falling from her eyes. Jay nodded her head. She hugged her mother and then went to hold hands with Katie. I gave Renee a hug and told her to call me if anything changed and that I would see her in the morning that evening was a tough one. Both girls hardly ate anything and were quiet, hardly speaking. I got them to bed and then turned to myself. But sleep was hard to come by the next morning. I woke the girls and pretty much had to force them to eat breakfast when I told Katie that I was going to drop her off at school. She almost went ballistic. I took her to the side away from G. Honey, please, I need you to listen to me right now. G is going to need to be with her mom. The time is going to come when she needs you, and that's when you will be there for her. Okay, all right, Dad, I understand. I could tell she wasn't happy about it. That's my girl, I said, giving her a hug after dropping Katie off. I did Jeannie by her house. She used her key to let us in, and I had her pack her mother some fresh clothes and anything else she felt her mother might need when we arrived at the room James was in. We found Renee asleep in a chair beside his bed. I sat down the overnight bag we had brought, and Jeannie and I went back out to the waiting room so her mother could sleep. It was another hour and a half before a haggard Renee came out looking for us. J.A. and I hugged her, and then I led her to the cafeteria and bought her some breakfast. It took a bit of prodding to get her to eat, but her lack of appetite was understandable. When she was finished, I went to the desk on the floor and asked if there was somewhere that Renee could shower and change. The nurse was sympathetic under the circumstances and took her to the nurse's locker room. She returned looking somewhat better. 
The rest of the day was spent with Renee and J.E. taking turns sitting with James while I stayed in the waiting area. Consoling with Chev was not in there. The doctors came back a little afternoon and ran another battery of tests. The prognosis was not good when it was time for school to let out, I went. And picked up Katie and we returned to the hospital until late evening when I again took the girls home. It was half past five in the morning when my phone rang. I knew before I even answered it, I heard Renee obviously crying on the other end tell me that James had passed. I could only tell her how sorry I was and that the girls and I would be there as soon as possible. I quickly dressed and made my way to Katie's bedroom. The girls were asleep in her bed. I gently woke Katie and put my finger to her lips before she could speak and beckoned her to follow me. I told her that her friend's father had died and she began to cry. I pulled her into a hug. Honey G is going to need your support now. I need you to hurry and get dressed while I talk with her when you're ready. She will probably need your help getting dressed. We need to get to the hospital for Renee. Katie looked at me and nodded, wiping the tears from her eyes. Okay, Dad, I will help her. My daughter suddenly looked more mature than her 14 years, and I was proud of her. I then woke Jeannie, and as difficult as it was, I told her that her father had died. She broke down sobbing, and I held her in my arms for several minutes. I then told her that her mother needed us, and with Katie's help, she was soon dressed and we were on our way. It was heartbreaking to watch mother and daughter in a sobbing embrace as they shared their grief. Katie was crying as well, and holding tightly to me, she too knew what it was like to lose a parent. Soon I left Katie with Renee and G, and went to find the hospital administrators, I informed them that we would have a funeral home contact them as soon as we had chosen one. I then gently led Renee and her daughter out to the car and drove them home. Once there, I settled them into the den and asked her what phone calls needed to be made. She gave me a list of people to call, including her parents and James' brother. Like me, James' parents had already passed away and his brother was his only relative. I also called Keith and Shelley on my recommendation. James and Renee had chosen to use Shelley as their family lawyer. They dropped everything and came over right away. Shelley stayed with Renee while I made the phone calls, including arranging with a funeral home to take charge of James' remains, the toll of her loss, and the lack of sleep finally overcame Renee. And with Shelley's help, she was put to bed afterward. I talked with Shelley. She told me that she would handle the estate matters pro bono and that she had a copy of James' will. She also let me know that they will be referred to two burial plots that James had purchased. I thanked Keith and Shelley for coming, and when they had left, I set about fixing lunch for the girls. The rest of the day was quiet with bouts of tears from both G and Katie. The emotional toll soon overcame both girls, and as soon as dinner was over, they both turned in. Jay didn't want to sleep alone, so once more both girls slept in the same bed, I decided to stay in the guest room. And after I had locked up for the night, I too felt the drain of energy and went to bed. I was tired enough that I slept through the night. I awoke around six and quickly dressed, but I realized that I was not the first up as I was met by the smell of coffee. As I stepped out of the room, I walked to the kitchen where Renee was sitting at the table. She started and gasped when I walked in. Steve, I didn't realize you were still here. Well, Jeannie wanted Katie to stay with her, and I decided to stay in your guest room just in case I didn't say just in case what. But Renee knew what I meant. I told her about the arrangements that had been made with the funeral home, and I told her that I would. Pick up her parents at the airport as they were flying in today. She thanked me for everything I had done when our daughters finally appeared. I told Renee to remain seated, and I made breakfast for everyone once I had the kitchen cleaned. It was time to leave for the airport. I arrived early enough to be waiting at arrivals when they came out. I had no trouble recognizing them as I had seen their pictures at Renee's house. Mr. and Mrs. Hanley, I'm Steve Connor, Renee's boss, I said, holding out my hand. It's nice to meet you, Steve. Please call me Dan, and this is my wife, Victoria. I feel as if I almost know you. Our daughter often speaks of you when we talk. She regards you very highly, Renee's father said, shaking my hand. The feelings are mutual. Then I couldn't accomplish what I do without her help. Both she and James have become dear friends. I just wish we were meeting under better circumstances. Renee's mother gave me a hug. I like both of them. Immediately, we gathered their luggage and loaded it in the car, and I drove them to their daughter's home. It was a bittersweet reunion, and more tears were shed. Katie and I stayed for lunch before taking our leave. James' funeral was held on Friday. 
His brother was there, as well as many of James' friends he had been quite popular due to his easygoing ways and quick humor. I was also pleased to see that many of the subcontractors who had worked for me over the years and had gotten to know Rene showed up to pay their respects. Rene's parents stayed for another two days, and on Sunday they invited Katie and I over for lunch. After lunch, we adults went into the living room while Katie went with to her room. We had been talking about everyday mundane things until Renee's mother spoke up. Honey, do you know what your plans are now? You know, we would love to have you move back home, Victoria said to her daughter. I know, Mom, you and Dad have always been there to support me, and I love you for that, but this has all been so sudden that J.E. and I are going to need some time to decide what we are going to do. Renee replied, as soon as I know what we decide, I will let you know until now. I hadn't thought about the possibility that Renee might move away, and that sudden realization gave me a hollow feeling in the pit of my stomach, and yet as her friend, I would support whatever she decided I stayed until a little after five. And before leaving, took Renee aside, I know you need time to mourn and to think about your life now. I want you to take all the time you need. Don't worry about work. And if you do decide to move back with your parents, I want you to know I will support your decision. You have to do what's best for you and Jeannie now. In the meantime, if you need anything at all, please call. I'll always be here for you. Renee teared up and gave me a hug. Thank you, Steve. I don't think I would have made it this far without you. Renee's father followed Katie and me out to the car. And after I had her belted and he stuck his hand out to me, Steve Renee has told me how much you have done for her and Jeannie through all this. I want you to know how much Victoria and I appreciate it. I shudder to think how much worse it would have been without your support. I shook his hand. Dan, it's the least that I could do. She and James and G were there for me and Katie after my wife left and abandoned our daughter. It was their love that really brought my daughter out of her depression. As long as she remains here, you can rely on me to look after them the best I can over the next two weeks. Katie and I would stop by to check on Renee and Jay. She never mentioned if she had decided what she was going to do with her future, and I was content not to pry and give her time. Jay stayed home with her mother for the first week following the funeral and then returned to school. It was Monday, a week later, that I went in the office and saw her car parked outside. She was sitting at her desk when I walked in. I knew she had reached a decision. I just stood staring at her, waiting for her to speak. Well, boss, are you going to show me what all you messed up the last couple weeks so I can fix it? She asked. Does this mean I left it there, not daring to finish the question? Yes, it means we're staying. This is Jeannie's home and all her friends are. Here, I think it would make this even harder for her to make her move, besides... We both know you need me to keep your business running. She gave me a smile with the last sentence I exhaled, not even realizing, Ising, I had been holding my breath. You sure know how to butter up your boss, I said with a big grin on my face with that said. I caught her up on the last two weeks' events, and then she kicked me out of the office, telling me to keep on eye on the subcontractors. I don't think the smile left my face all day. Over the next year, it seemed that we spent almost every weekend together due to our daughter's friendship. Renee and I would attend the girls' sporting events and other school activities together. If they didn't have school events, the girls would usually come to my house. I always made sure that Renee would come too. I didn't want her sitting around feeling depressed. Our friendship continued to grow to the point that there was nothing we couldn't speak to each other about. As for Katie, Renee had become a surrogate mother to whom she could talk about things that a young teen girl would be embarrassed to talk to her father about. I guess I also became a father figure to Jeannie as well. Of course, when it came to being a disciplinarian figure, the girls would usually just giggle at me. And it would have to be Renee who stepped in. Both girls knew they had me wrapped around their little fingers. The nice thing is that they were both good girls, and we rarely denied them anything. It was a Saturday just a little over a year after James had passed away. I had run over to one of the houses I had under construction to handle a small crisis. When I got back home, I saw Renee's car in the driveway we had planned a barbecue and a day of lounging around the pool. When I came into the house, I could hear the girls laughing and giggling out back, so I went to the laundry room and got my swim trunks where I had left them to dry. Normally, I would change in my bedroom, but today I figured I would just slip into the downstairs bathroom with suit in hand. I opened the door, and my eyes went wide. Standing in front of me was Renee. She was just reaching for her bikini top and was only wearing a skimpy pair of panties. 
I couldn't help but stare at her body. Of course, I had seen her in a bikini before, but never like this. Her body was perfect, Dot. I know I only stood there for a couple seconds, but it seemed much longer. Renee gasped and crossed her arms across her chest. Oh my God, I'm so sorry, I stuttered. I quickly turned and pulled the door shut behind me and rushed to the living room. I was totally flustered, I remember thinking that I hoped I hadn't ruined our friendship and that she didn't hate me. Ten minutes passed before Renee came out wearing her bikini. I know she could see how ashamed I looked, Renee. I am sorry I heard the girls out by the pool and thought you were out there too. I really didn't mean to walk in on you. I spoke in a rush. She stood in front of me trying to look mad that lasted all of about ten seconds until she laughed. She walked over to me and patted my cheek. Steve, I know you would never do that intentionally. It's okay. Don't worry about now go get changed and put the chicken on the grill I'm hungry with that she turned and headed for the pool as I stood with my mouth hanging open as I watched her leave. I let out a sigh of relief that she wasn't mad at me. Of course, I hurried and did as she asked. I went out back and saw Renee sipping wine while the girls romped in the pool. I grilled the chicken trying to, to keep myself from staring at her. I couldn't get the image of her in the bathroom out of my mind. After we had eaten, we sat in recliners getting some sun. By now we were talking again, as we always had. The only thing else that happened was that during a lull in the conversation, Renee looked at me and smirked. I know I must have blushed the sun was setting when they left. G had invited Katie to spend the night, so she went with them as the girls headed to the car. Renee came and gave me a kiss on the cheek and another sly grin. I breathed a sigh of relief when they had gone. At least my faxa had not ruined our friendship. I went into my home office and went over some paperwork before turning in for the night. It was only when I was in bed did my mind return to the event earlier in the day I could see her standing practically naked in front of me. That image caused my emotions to stir. I reached down and felt myself start to get hard. This was the first time I had an erection since my wife left me. I guess what makes that remarkable in itself was that until then, I had had a very high sex drive. I always thought I was A-B normal as I seemed to have a perpetual heart on and spent most of my time trying to get into my wife's holes. I knew that the reason my ex had left wasn't due to a lack of sex when I went to pick up Katie Sunday afternoon. I was uneasy as I was afraid she could see in my eyes what I had done when I thought about it later. I'm sure she just thought I was still embarrassed over what had happened the day before the next week was a confusing one for me. Whenever I was in the office, I would find myself staring at her. I couldn't understand my feelings for the last two years. I hadn't had the urge to be with a woman or even around women Renee didn't count. She wasn't a woman. She was my friend. As a result of this, I spent a lot of time at the construction sites and away from the office, two things were happening the next Saturday. The first was that Renee and I were dropping our daughters off at a two-week sleepaway sports camp for girls. The second was that the local building association, of which I was a member, was having their annual awards night. It was held in a ballroom of one of the hotels in town. After dinner, the there would be awards handed out in several categories, and then the floor would be open for dancing. Renee was going with me. Renee and I dropped the girls off at the camp Saturday morning. They were so excited they almost forgot to tell us goodbye. That got Renee and I laughing as I took her back to her house. I dropped her off and told her I would pick her up at 600 and went back home. I spent the day working in the garden to keep my mind off things I didn't want to think about. Right at six, I knocked on Renee's door and my jaw dropped when she opened the door. She was dressed in a little black dress that was sexy without being obscene. She wore a pearl necklace and black high heels and black stockings. God, you are stunning, I stuttered out. This got me a wide smile. Why, thank you, kind sir. Despite the temptation to stare at her, I kept my eyes on the road, and our conversation was light and unaffected, as was usual for two close friends. We sat at a table with three other builders and their wives. They were spec builders. As was, I talk around the table was primarily shop talk dinner, was a choice of either fish or chicken, and it was actually quite good, which is often rare for one of these events. Then our attention was turned to the de-ice as the awards were announced when the award for quality of product was announced, and my name was called. Renee jumped from her seat with glee. I kept my acceptance speech short. I want to thank the association for this recognition, but most of all, I want to thank Renee. This award is hers as much as mine if it wasn't for all her efforts to keep me lined out. 
I wouldn't be here today. She stood with tears in her eyes when I returned to our table and hugged me and then surprised me with a kiss on the lips. It wasn't an erotic kiss, but it was the first time we had ever kissed each other on anything. But the cheek, I felt a surge of adrenaline shoot through me after the awards were handed out. The dance floor was cleared. I accepted the congratulations from many of my peers in the business and then asked Renee if she would like to dance. She accepted my invitation and we headed out to the dance floor. The first song we danced was a fast one. Now I'm not much of a Dan answer, but I couldn't keep my eyes off her as she was like poetry in motion. The next song was a slow one, and I was about to lead her back to the table when she slid into my arms and put her arms around my neck. I didn't resist. I put my arms around her waist and we began to sway to the music it had been over two years since I held a woman. And holding this woman had an immediate effect and I could feel movement down my pants like I tried to pull back, but she wouldn't let me. I only hoped she didn't feel the effect she was having on me when the song ended. I let her precede me back to the table, hoping no notice the bulge in my pants. Renee finished her glass of wine and then turned to me. Steve, I think a perfect way to end this evening would be to go back to your house for a soak in the hot tub. I didn't want the evening to end and to have to take her home, so I quickly agreed we talked about the award on the way home and the positive effect it could have on the business. When I had built my home, I had it equipped with all the latest in remote technology. I could control the heating and cooling and the lighting from my mobile phone. I could also turn the hot tub on the same way that way it was already heated when we arrived, since Renee and J.E. spent a lot of time at my pool when the weather permitted they had taken to leaving their swimsuits there. I fetched our suits, and while she went to the bathroom to change, I quickly changed into mine. In the laundry room, I grabbed a bottle of wine and two glasses and went ahead to wait for her. I was glad to already be in the tub under the bubbles because the sight of her walking out and her bikini was enough to cause me to swell again. She slid into the water and accepted the glass of wine I handed her for the first ten minutes we didn't speak. Just basked in the warm water. She broke the silence first. Steve, it's been over two years since Rhonda walked out on. You have you thought about having a woman in your life again? I know that I blushed at that question and hopped that with the darkness she wouldn't notice I wasn't going to lie to my friend. The truth is that until very recently I haven't even thought about it. I guess I was pretty scarred over what happened you said until recently has something happened to change your thoughts, she asked. No, I know my face was totally flushed well. Um, I mumbled I looked at her and even in the low light I could see a sly smile on her face. She set her glass down and I saw her hand reach behind her back and then I sat slack jaw as her bikini bra rode to the top of the water, buoyed out by the bubbles she rose up enough that her breasts were clear of the water. Was it seeing me like this? Oh God, Renee. I moaned as my tool strained at my swim trucks. She slid through the water, and upon reaching me, she parted her legs and straddled my legs as she sat in my lap, facing me. Her arms went around my neck. Stephen, when James died, I didn't think I would ever have feelings for anyone again when he was alive. We did talk about what would happen if either one of us passed on, and we both agreed that we would never want the other to spend their life in grief. I will always love James, but I've come to realize that there can be room in my heart for another. For a minute, we sat staring in each other's eyes. Steve, say something, am I making a fool of self? She asked worriedly. I broke my silence. No, you're not. I have been fighting my feelings for you. I was afraid to lose your friendship if I let you know we found ourselves locked in a deep kiss. We had wild, passionate sex that night. Once we were done, we slept in each other's arms. Good morning, beautiful. I said good morning, stud. She said with a giggle, she reached over and took hold of my morning wood and stroked it. Are you always hard like this? I grinned at her. What can I say? I've always had a very high sex drive, and you just bring out of me even more with a wicked grin. She rolled me over onto my back and then straddled me for a good ten minutes. She kept up a slow pace. She let out an eek and went as screwing me in. Earnest, I wrapped my arms around her, and she purred in pleasure as I stroked her back. Finally, she told me she was hungry, so we got out of bed and quickly showered before heading for the kitchen. I whipped us up a couple of Denver omelets and smiled inwardly as I washed her wolfet down after we had cleaned up the kitchen. We took our coffee and went to sit on the back deck for a while. We just sat quietly enjoying being in each other's company. Did you mean it's Steve? She asked out of the blue. 
I was a little confused. Did I mean what, honey, that my cut now belongs to you? She said with a cute blush. Renee, we have known each other for seven years now. For the first five, you became my right hand. The person who I depended on two years ago, you became so much more when you took me and Katie under your wing to help us through a hard time now. In the last year, you have ALS become the dearest and closest friend I've ever had now. I know that I cannot deny it. I not only love you as a friend, but I am head over heels in love with you. So the answer to your question is yes, I want you to belong to me. But more than that, I want all of you to belong to me, especially your heart. I want to belong to you 100% my heart and my soul. When I had finished speaking, the tears began to flow from her eyes. At first, I thought I had made a mistake telling her the truth that was in my heart until she jumped into my lap and kissed me with total passion. I love you too, darling. I want us to belong to each other, and I promise you that I am all yours. We spent the rest of that Sunday making love whenever and wherever in the house the moment was right. Monday morning, we woke up together and we showered together in the went to, her place for fresh clothes before heading for the office while she fixed coffee. I went over the day's paperwork. I gave her a kiss and then headed out to make the rounds of the three houses we had in progress at lunchtime. I picked up some Chinese takeout and returned to the office to eat with Renee. After we were finished, I started to tell her about how the construction was progressing after work that day. We went back by Renee's house, and she packed a suitcase to bring to my house. We never even discussed it. We both knew she would be staying with me for the next two weeks while the girls were in camp. Those two weeks were filled with lovemaking. Even we only did it in the office a couple times. I did enjoy bending her over my desk and plowing her fields for her, if you know what I mean. Finally, the Friday the day before we were to pick up the girls came, we needed to talk about the future we agreed on two things. First was that we didn't want to live apart and she would be willing to move into my home. But most important was what the girls thought and wanted. With that, we decided that I would drop her and Jeannie at their house after we picked up the girls and I would take Katie home and we would each talk it over with our daughters. For my part, one was pretty sure that Katie would be happy with Renee's and Jay moving in with us. She and Jay were already as close as sisters and Renee had become her mother in every way, except officially. My real worry is how Jay would take it. I was afraid that she would feel like we were dishonoring the memory of her father. We had decided that in the event that either or both girls objected, we would not live together, but we would continue to be committed to each other and would wait until we received their approval, or until they graduated high school and went to college. Once Katie and I got home, I set to making us lunch while I listened to her excitedly tell me about their time at camp. It was obvious that both girls had a lot of fun. It was only an hour after we had finished eating that Katie finally wound down, and I had a chance to talk to her about Renee and me, Katie. Over the last year, we have spent a lot of time with Renee and Jay, it's like we have become a family, Katie looked at me and nodded in agreement. Well, while you girls were at Camp Renee and I had a lot of time to talk things over and we thought that maybe it was time that we actually were one. What does that mean, Daddy? It means that I would like to have Renee and G come live with us when the time is right. I want to make Renee my wife, but we will only do that if both you and Jay are in agreement with this. Katie squealed and jumped up excitedly and rushed over to hug my neck. Oh, Daddy, I think that would be wonderful. Jay will really be my sister then, and I already love Renee like a mother. I've got to call Jay. Well, they pumpkin hang on for a minute. Renee is going to talk to Jay about this. She might not see things the same as you do, so I think it would be best if you wait until we know how she feels about it, okay? Katie pondered what I had said for a minute and then gave me a knowing smile and shrugged her shoulders. Okay, Daddy, I'll wait. The wait wasn't too long, for in less than 20 minutes, the house phone rang. Caller ID said it was Renee, so I quickly answered. She told me that G wanted to talk to Katie, but wouldn't say anything more nervously. I handed the phone to my daughter, and she ran off to her bedroom to talk in private. I am used to how long teenagers can spend talking on the phone, and as time passed, it proved that this was not going to be an exception. My nerves were pretty fray after an hour had passed. Suddenly, Katie ran from her room and out the front door. All I heard was what sounded like happy squealing. And before I could get to the door, Katie came back in with Jeannie. The two teenagers bounded across the room. 
and I was quickly being hugged by two bubbly girls, I then looked up to see a smiling Renee coming through the door carrying two suitcases. Just as quickly as I had been the center of their hugs, the two girls broke away and ran to Renee and grabbed the suitcases and disappeared upstairs. I just stood there with my mouth open until Renee walked over and tried to shove her tongue down my throat. I moaned and returned her kiss. I take it. Everything went as well as we could have hoped for. I asked once we came up for air. Apparently our daughters had already talked about this happening, and we all for it. They were just waiting for us to realize we wanted it too, she said with a laugh. We went out to dinner that night to celebrate the joining of our families, and spent Sunday making several trips to Renee's house to bring the rest of their belongings to their new home. Renee and I discussed what to do with her house, and decided that she would sell it. The real estate market was pretty hot, so she got a nice profit for it. She offered to have it deposited in a joint account, but I had a better idea, and we put into a savings account that J.E. would use for college. I felt that James would be happy, knowing that he was providing for his daughter's education life for the next year was wonderful. Even if I was living in a home where I was outnumbered three to one by females, they seemed to always get their way 99% of the time but it made me happy to make them happy on the rare occasion I was in. In total disagreement, they would accept my decision. Also, my sex drive had returned in spades, and I could rarely keep my hands off Renee. For her part, she was my woman, and did everything she could to keep me satisfied. There was also a big upside to the award I had received, in that it led to many requests that I build homes for people as such. My business screw to where I would often have as many as ten houses under construction at one time in order to keep up with the load Renee took to working in the field, and we had to hire another person to handle the work in the office. I left the hiring up to Renee as she really was the most qualified in knowing what had to be done. Renee and I married the next spring. Following the time they moved in, we kept the wedding informal and invited only a small group of select friends. Shell was Renee's bridesmaid, and Keith was my best man. I took Renee to Fiji for a week-long honeymoon. We even managed to tear ourselves away from the bedroom to see the sights. It was shortly after we joined our household that Katie began to call Renee mom. I was happy that they had bond Ed so well as for G. It wasn't until just after her 17th birthday that she called me dad for the first time. I don't even remember what it was she wanted. But I vividly remember when I told her okay that she kissed me on the cheek and said thank you, daddy. That simple token brought tears to my eyes. And when I looked at Renee, her eyes were glistening with happiness too. Of course, in my mind, both Katie and G were my daughters, and I loved them equally as emotional as that was. It was surpassed many times over a couple of weeks later. Renee was out shopping and I was at home with the girls when they came in and sat down. I knew from the looks on their faces that something was up and it looked to be serious, Daddy. I'm your daughter and you love me, don't you? Katie asked. Of course I do, baby, I answered while wondering what I was being set up for. Well, I think that you love G like me too, right? She continued. I glanced quickly at Jay, who was obvious very nervous, but watching me intently, you both know that I love you both equally. Then how come you haven't adopted her so that you're really her daddy? And my sister Katie asked to say I was stunned would be an understatement I turned to G.E. Honey. There is nothing more in this world I would rather do than to make you my legal daughter. Would you like me to adopt you? The tears began to flow from her eyes and her chin was quivering. Yes, Daddy, I really would. Now the tears began to flow from my eyes, and I held my arms open and she flew into them. Renee arrived home just then to find Jeannie in my lap with both of us crying before she could ask what was going on. Katie went to her and started whispering in her ear. Renee set her bags down and came rushing over, and now there were three of us hugging and crying tears of joy. I looked up to Katie and saw her crying too, so I held out one hand for her, our bond as a whole family was completed that afternoon. From the ashes of two tragedies in the lives of two families had come a renewal of love and hope. Life was good, dear listeners. Help us reach 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. Something super special awaits once we hit that milestone. Subscribe now and join the fun.